This is the first of a few lectures on elliptic functions. I'm not following any particular textbook, but um, Cambridge University Press has recently reprinted the classic book A Course on Modern Analysis by Whitaker and Watson, and this contains a rather in-depth collection of chapters on elliptic functions. So first of all, what is an elliptic function? Um, well, um, a periodic function is a function like sine of x. So you know sine of x plus 2 pi is equal to sine of x. And here, this 2 pi is the period. Um, it's also got other periods, so obviously 4 pi, 6 pi, and so on are also periods. So, um, But all the periods are essentially multiples of 2 pi. And you can ask, can you have a function with two independent periods, say the periods are omega 1 and omega 2? Well, at first sight it seems you can't really, because if omega 1 over omega 2 is rational, then you can just take the greatest common denominator, greatest common divisor of these, and there's essentially only one per period generating them. If it's an irrational real, this means the periods are dense, um, and this means the only function with all those periods are essentially constant and if they're continuous. So, so um, there doesn't seem to be any way of having two independent periods. Well, that's if you're talking about functions of a real variable. Um, so um, what we're going to do is to talk about functions of a complex variable. So, so we're going to take, we're going to be looking at elliptic fu at functions f of z for z complex such that f of z plus omega 1 is equal to f of z, and f of z plus omega 2 is equal to f of z for all z, where the ratio um, omega 2 over omega 1 is not real. Because if it is real, nothing very interesting happens. Um, unfortunately, um, um, one of the main problems in the theory of elliptic functions is that notation for elliptic functions is a complete mess and not standardized at all. So um, you know, every author who writes about elliptic functions invents their own system of notation. So um, I'm using omega 1 and omega 2 for two of the periods, but other books will use all sorts of different notation for this. Um, so the periods form a sort of lattice. So if you take 0 here, and omega 1 might be this complex number, and omega 2 might be a complex number here. And then all the other integral multiples of omega 1 and omega 2, so m omega 1 plus n omega 2, form a lattice, um, which I'm going to denote by L for lattice. So we get a sort of grid in the plane. Um, and this means that the elliptic function is going to be the same if you shift by um, any, any one of these lattice points. So um, I have here a picture of an elliptic function. Um, this is um, from the book by Janke and Emder. And here's um, an elliptic function that we might discuss later. It's one of Jacobi's elliptic functions. You can see it's sort of periodic in this direction. It's also periodic in that direction. Um, so um, what I want to do this lecture is uh, basically find all elliptic functions. Um, so the first question is, can we find any holomorphic um, elliptic functions? And the answer is these all have to be constant, so they're not very interesting. Um, and the reason for this is that f is bounded in a fundamental domain. So a fundamental domain is, is going to be a region that looks a bit like this. And this fundamental domain is compact, so f being continuous is bounded in it. Um, so it's bounded in a fundamental domain. And since it's periodic, 
must be bounded everywhere and because every point is equivalent to a point in the fundamental domain and if a holomorphic function is bounded on the whole plane it must be constant and for this you use Liouville's theorem from complex analysis which says any bounded holomorphic function has to be constant so um, we should we, we should allow poles so f is going to be meromorphic which just means it's allowed some poles um, so um, the next question is how can we find examples of um, elliptic functions well um, there's a very general a method if you've got a group g acting on some vector space v and you want to find something in the vector space fixed by g so we want to find a vector with g v equals v for all g in v in g there's a very simple way of doing this you just take any um, element v of the vector space and just sum over all um uh all things in g acting on and th this is fixed by g if this series converges so this is the catch it doesn't always work because um, this group g might be infinite and then it's not clear if this this converges now what we're going to do is to take g to be our lattice um, which is a, a sum of two copies of z under addition and we're going to take v to be meromorphic functions and the action is just translation if lambda is an element of the lattice then and and we've got some function f then uh, we can change f of z to f of z plus lambda and you can easily check this gives us a group action so what we would want to do is to take sum over all lambda in the lattice l so that's lambda equals m lambda 1 plus n lambda 2 of f of z plus lambda so let's call this big f of z and there's a pretty good chance that this might be elliptic as long as this converges well we've got this convergence condition and um, in order for this to converge the terms must at least tend to zero so we must have f of z tends to zero as the absolute value of z tends to infinity because otherwise the series isn't going to converge um, so there are some obvious examples of functions like this we can try f of z is 1 over z to the n for some integer n so let's have a look at the first few of these and see if it converges so let's try f of z equals 1 over z and check for convergence so, so we, we're taking sum over lambda in lambda of um, 1 over z minus lambda z plus lambda i don't really care so um in order to test this for convergence what we do is we take the complex plane and we draw a lot of circles of radius one two three and so on and then and then count the number of terms with lambda inside each circle and there are going to be about um, um, some constant times n terms in the nth circle or the nth ring and the terms are all going to be about 1 over n um, in absolute value already be um, so, 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 so lambda is going to be approximately n and lambda is very large so it's much larger than z so you can ignore z so the sum we get looks like sum over n greater than or equal to 1 of n over n and this obviously diverges um, rather badly it's, it doesn't work if you try this function well let's try f of z equals 1 over z squared well here we get the same argument except the terms are about 1 over n squared so we get sum of n over n squared and this still diverges but only just it's right on the borderline of divergence you know this is this is the harmonic series which 
which does tend to infinity but very slowly and if you change this exponent n to anything bigger than 2 this will converge so we can try f of z equals 1 over z z cubed and here the series sum over 1 over z minus lambda cubed now converges and gives um and gives an example of an elliptic function so you can see it's got a pull at every um, point of lambda um, and this is this is why elliptic functions sort of look like this you can see there are all these poles here and the, the poles kind of live on some sort of lattice um, this picture actually has poles of order one at every point rather than order three and we'll talk about that later um, so so we've got plenty of elliptic functions it turns out that the most convenient function um, to use is not this one here but this function here um, well there's a bit of a problem with it because it diverges so it doesn't actually give us an elliptic function but it's so close to converging that we can make it converge by by just nudging it a little bit so let's figure out why um, wh why it doesn't converge well um, the problem is um, that if we take one over z minus lambda squared this is going to be approximately one over lambda squared and the, the sum of one over lambda squared um, diverges however it's if you expand it further it's, it's sort of one over lambda squared plus two z over lambda cubed plus something over lambda to the four and so on and for these bits there's no problem um, um, the terms for 1 over lambda cubed and 1 over lambda 4 and so on can converge if you sum them over all lambda so so the thing we have to worry about is is just um this bad term here but you notice this is just a constant so what we can do is we can just subtract off this constant from all the terms and we get sum over lambda in lambda of 1 over z minus lambda squared minus 1 over lambda squared and what we've done is this is formally periodic but isn't periodic because it um, doesn't converge um, so what we've done is we've sort of subtracted an infinite constant from it to make it converge well there's still one more problem because um, this is infinite if lambda equals z zero so we we, we, we we omit this constant if lambda equals zero so so the sum we get is a sum over all these things for lambda in the lattice except when lambda is zero we just omit this term and um, this is the um this is the famous weierstrass um p function um which is defined by um this sum here. Um, Weierstrass used um, a capital letter P from some funny script alphabet and um, every letter of the script alphabet seems to be lost except for P which lives on as this, as this strange sort of fossil in the mathematical literature. Um, so well the problem is is P periodic because you see it's not at all obvious that it is periodic. I mean these terms are not invariant under changing z to z plus an element of lambda because there's this sort of funny infinite constant and we have to worry about this a bit but um, it, we can see that it is in fact periodic and this follows from the first from these two facts first of all if we take p of z and differentiate it it's equal to um, minus two times sum over one over z minus lambda cubed which is periodic so its derivative is periodic um, this doesn't mean that the function itself is periodic because you can get functions with periodic derivative that aren't periodic for instance you would have a function that sort of keeps going up in bumps like that however p has another property that p of z is even so p of z is equal to p of minus c and that's kind of obvious if you look at 
this because the, the, the terms um if, if you change z to minus c and then change lambda to minus lambda you just get the same terms and if a function is periodic and even so if it's if the derivative is periodic and the function is even you can easily check as a little exercise this that, that, that means the function is periodic because you, you know p of z plus lambda must be equal to c of lambda plus p of z for some c depending on lambda and if if you just um look at the term for minus lambda and do a little bit of algebra you can see that this that the, the fact that this is even implies c of lambda must actually be zero so we found a periodic function in fact i can draw an ex uh, i have an explicit picture of weierstrass's function um, it looks like this um, you can see the pole is a little bit fatter than the poles in the previous picture because these were poles of order one and this is a pole of order two which is kind of a bit bigger and heftier um, <clears throat> so um, um, so we found one periodic function we found several periodic functions because we can take various other inverse powers of z so let's show that we've in fact found all periodic functions <coughs> or at least we can do fairly simple manipulations to these to find all, all periodic functions because we notice that if fc is periodic then so is f of z, z plus any constant c and so is p of f of z over q of f of z where p and q are polynomials. We need p and q to be polynomials, so this is still meromorphic. So if we've got one periodic function, we can get lots of others by these simple tricks. And we, we now want to show that we can in fact get all periodic functions just by applying this method here to the ones we've already found. Um, so first of all, um, we, can, um, we can get rid of of poles not on um, the lattice L. And here, if you've got a periodic function, we can just multiply it by um, P of Z minus P of C if um, F is a pole at Z equals C. Or maybe we need to raise it to some power to get rid of a pole. So by multiplying F by by polynomials in Weierstrass's function, we can get rid of all poles that are not in the lattice L. And we're just left with a, an elliptic function whose only poles are on L. Um, next, we, we can um, make f even. So f of z is equal to an even function, even periodic function, Plus an odd periodic function. And the usual way you write a, a function is the sum of an even and an odd function. And the odd one is equal to p prime of z times an even function. So this is the derivative of Weierstrass's function, which you can easily see is an odd function. So if you divide an odd function by an odd function, you get an even function. So it's enough to do um, um, even periodic functions. So we, we, we can assume that f is even, the only poles are on L. And now, if we look at Weierstrass's function p of z, it's equal to 1 over z squared plus some other terms I don't care about. So if you raise it to the power of n, it's equal to 1 over z to the 2n plus something or other. So, um, taking f of z minus a linear combination of p, p prime and so on, we can kill the pole at zero. So, so um, can assume f has no poles.
because we've got rid of them all. And by what we said earlier, any elliptic function with no poles at all is constant. So what we've shown is that any elliptic function is some elliptic function whose only pole is, is, is on the lattice points divided by a polynomial in P. And we've shown that any elliptic function whose only poles are at lattice points is a polynomial in P plus the derivative of P times a polynomial in P. So we've got a complete description of all elliptic functions. So let's write that this out explicitly. Um, elliptic functions with poles on L can be written are, are, are just um, all polynomials in X and Y where X is equal to the Weierstrass function, Y is equal to the Weierstrass function um, differentiated, except we've got to quotient out by a relation. And you notice that if we take the Weierstrass function derivative and square it, this is even, and it looks like z to the minus 6 plus something. So it's equal to, sorry, 4z to the minus 6. So it's equal to 4 times p cubed plus something times p squared plus something times p plus some constant. Because any even function whose only poles are at lattice points is a polynomial in p. Um, this term is in fact 0, as you can check without too much difficulty. And these are called minus g2 and minus g3 um, for no particularly good reason. So um, we have to quotient out by x cube, 4x cubed minus g um, 2x minus g3 minus y squared. So here we have a explicit description of all elliptic functions. The ones with poles only on L are just this polynomial ring quotiented out by this ideal. And the ones with poles anywhere are just the, um, uh, are given by the field of quotients of this ring here. So, so, so we, we know all elliptic functions in a, in a reasonably explicit way. Um, this actually gives us a, a sort of um, isomorphism um, if we take the complex numbers and modulo out by this lattice, so we identify any two complex numbers if, if they differ by an element of this lattice, then we can actually identify this with the curve consisting of um, numbers such that y squared equals 4x cubed minus um, g2x minus g3. So this is um, some sort of curve in the plane, which might look something like this. Uh, I should say C over L minus the zero, because we're, we're mapping a point Z to the point P of Z, P prime of Z, which is equal to the point X, Y. So here Z is a point of the, of, of, of the complex numbers, or the complex numbers modulo L minus zero. Um, so, in other words, um, the, 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 the space of complex numbers modulo a lattice simply can be identified with a cubic curve uh, in the plane. Um, well, there's a question that um, 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 might have occurred to you which is we managed to get an elliptic function with the pole of order 2 um, at um, lattice points. Why can't we get an elliptic function with the pole of order 1 at lattice points by taking this series sum over 1 over z minus lambda and um, getting rid of the divergent terms just as we did with, with the other ones. So um, if we take one, let's take one over z plus lambda. So this is going to be approximately one over lambda minus c over lambda squared plus c squared over lambda cubed, and so on. And these terms here are small, and these terms here cause a problem. So let's just subtract them as we did before and take sum over lambda 
of 1 over z plus lambda and then subtract these difficult terms plus z over lambda squared. And this now converges. And so we, we get a function which is sometimes called the zeta function. It's rather confusing. It's, it's the Weierstrass zeta function, which has nothing to do with the Riemann zeta function. And let's see if this is an elliptic function. Well, first of all, zeta prime of z is um, minus um, um, the Weierstrass function. So it's periodic. Um, and this means that zeta of z plus a period is equal to zeta of z plus um, some constant, which is traditionally um, has a factor of two in there for obscure historical reasons. And similarly, this is going to be zeta of z plus another constant, eta one and eta of two. And the question is, are these a zero? Well, in the case of Weierstrass's p function, we managed to prove that corresponding constants were zero because p was even. However, you can easily check that zeta of z is odd. And this um, doesn't imply that this vanishes because it's perfectly easy to find um, odd functions which satisfy relations like this. Um, in fact, these constants can't both be zero. Um, um, you can see this as follows. Um, there's actually a relation between these um, constants, which is that um, 2 pi i is equal to the integral over c of zeta of z dz. Here, um, c is going to be the integral round fundamental domain, so naught, omega 1, omega 2, and so on. And we'd better avoid the um, poles on the um, fundamental domain. So I'm actually going to integrate round something that looks a bit like this. And this integral is equal to 2 pi i because this is 2 pi i times the um, um, sum of the residues. Um, and um, we can also um, work out the integral explicitly because the, the integral along the bottom and the top almost cancel out by almost periodicity and the integral along the top bottom and the top turns out to be essentially um, omega 1 times eta of 2 and similarly these two integrals here almost cancel out apart from a factor of omega 2 times eta of 1. Um, so what this turns out to be, if you keep careful track of the signs, is 2 eta 1 times omega 2 minus 2 eta 2 times omega 1. And this gives Legendre's relation between these, um, these four numbers here. So you see eta 1 and eta 2 can't possibly both be 0 because this, this factor here is non-zero. Um, if you look this up in books, by the way, you will sometimes find this differs by factors of 2 from... Um, formulas you sometimes find, and that's because periods are sometimes taken to be 2 omega 1 rather than omega 1 as I've taken them here. Um, I just finished with a little historical note about why elliptic functions are called elliptic functions. They don't actually have very much to do with ellipses. Um, the name comes from elliptic integrals, which are integrals of the form dt over square root of a cubic or quartic polynomial in t. And you get integrals like this if you try and work out the arc length of an ellipse, which is where the name elliptic comes from. Um, if, it's, if there's a quadratic polynomial here, you can easily do this in terms of arc sines and arc cosines and so on. Um, but if this has degree greater than two, you can't usually do that. Um, however, you can do it using elliptic functions. So suppose I want to integrate, um, say, dx over the square root of 4x cubed minus g2x minus g3. So here we've got a cubic in x. And what we can do is we can write x is p of z. You remember that p of z satisfies a 
funny differential equation. So P prime of Z squared is equal to 4x cubed minus G2x minus G3, where x is P. So this just turns out to be the integral of dx um, divided by P prime of of um, z. Um, so this is um, d p prime of z, so d p of z over p p prime of z, um, which is 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 just d z. So um, this mess here just turns out to be really just a differential dz. And this means you can sort of integrate this. And if you do this, you find z is actually equal to the integral from p of um, z to infinity of this integral here, dx over the square root of 4x cubed minus g2x minus g3. So you see that the elliptic function actually appears in a slightly funny way. It's not the value of this integral from from something to something else. It's what you have to put in to this integral to get z. Um, and elliptic intervals were originally discovered in this rather roundabout way. And this caused tremendous complications because defining them as the inverse of some function is really rather a mess. And this function you're defining them as an inverse of is a rather messy function of branch points and so on and everywhere. So um, it's when you're doing elliptic functions, it's probably best to forget about the, the historical origins of them because that, that's, that's just a rather unnecessarily complicated way of doing things. Um, OK, the next lecture will be more about properties of the Weierstrass elliptic function.